and whenever you're ready, Will. All right. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Will Singleton. It's a pleasure to be with you today. Nice and bright and sunny in Berkshire County, Pittsfield, Massachusetts is where I'm located. And welcome to the Right to Vote, Reexamining Women's Suffrage. Uh, it's a pleasure for me to introduce Ms. Barbara Berenson. She is the author of Massachusetts and the Women's Suffrage Movement, Revolutionary Reformers. Also, Boston and the Civil War, Hub of the Second Revolution, and Walking Tours of Civil War Boston, Hub of Abolition. She is the co-editor of Breaking Barriers, the unfinished story of women lawyers and judges in Massachusetts. Ms. Barrison earned her undergraduate degree from Harvard College and her law degree from Harvard Law School. She worked as a senior attorney at the Massachusetts Supreme Court until June of 2019. She is on the boards of Boston by Foot and the Royal House and Slave Quarters. She is currently teaching courses at Tufts University and at Harvard Law School. Ms. Burson has a new book coming out soon entitled After Suffrage, Massachusetts Women Activists Confront the 1920s. When I read this, Barbara, I said to myself, who would think that we need a new book entitled After Suffrage, United States Citizens Activists Confront the 2020s? <laughs> that is very true. Uh, it's a pleasure to have you with us. Ladies and gentlemen, it's Barbara Berenson. Thank you so much, um, Will, for that kind introduction. Um, thank you so much to all of you for arranging this program. It's my great pleasure and honor to be here. I just wish I was with all of you in person, but we will make do over our Zoom screen um, as best we can. Um, what I'm gonna do for a moment is just set up my screen share, which is the only really nerve wracking part of the afternoon for me. And I'm just gonna check in with Will or Andy to let me know that you can now see the first slide. Um, whoops. It's good. It's good. And you can see the second yeah. slide. Perfect. OK, well, welcome. Um, we, uh, uh, Barbara, do you want to go up to the top and press start slideshow? Should make it larger for us. Uh, you play from start? Yep. OK, is it now larger for all of you? There we go, yeah. OK, perfect. Um, let me just, it's wanting me to turn on subtitles, which I don't want to do, but okay. Um, if there's any issues, I have lots of slides. If you ever don't seem to see one advancing when you think it should be advancing, um, please somebody speak up and let me know. Um, my slides will correspond to what I'm saying. Um, so what we're going to talk about today is the women's suffrage movement with a particular focus on the story of some Massachusetts leaders who really should be familiar to everybody, but many of whom aren't. And we'll both talk about them and why their story is not well known. Um, today's talk is based on a book that I wrote that came out a couple of years ago, Massachusetts and the Women's Suffrage Movement, Revolutionary Reformers. And in that book, I tried to accomplish several goals. I wanted to, uh, talk about the story of women's suffrage uh, and talk about the so-called missing half, the story that's not focused on Susan B. Anthony, Elizabeth Cady Stanton, the story that is focused on Lucy Stone and many, many other extraordinary women based here in Massachusetts. So I wanted to look at Massachusetts' role at the center of this complete story. And I wanted to focus on why this story has been really obscured from view. Um, and is not well known, uh, and to try to um, shed some light on that. Obviously, that's way too much to accomplish in a talk of 90 minutes, um, and I'm not going to use the full 90 minutes to speak. I want to have plenty of room for time for Q&A. So what I am going to do today is to highlight some of the key episodes and the lessons learned. And I'm going to begin at what I call the beginning, but of course, whenever you talk about historical movement, it's a very complicated question to try to pinpoint when does something begin? And if we were together in person, I would probably ask a question that says something like this to all of you. Uh, how many of you have either read or heard or been taught that the women's suffrage movement began in Seneca Falls, New York in 1848 when Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Lucretia Mott called together the first ever convention to discuss women's rights. And I bet many of you would raise your hands. 
um, because that's what we've all been taught. But that, of course, begs the question of why. What had gone on before that? It's not as if one sunny day in July, 1848, Stanton and would have woken up and say, what shall we do today? I know, let's call together the first ever convention to discuss women's rights. Something must have happened that made them feel the time was ripe for such an extraordinary movement, uh, such an extraordinary moment. And I argue in my book that the groundwork was actually laid here in Massachusetts. And the reason in a nutshell, and this is its own separate long story that we're gonna just talk about briefly today, is that Massachusetts, as many of you may know, was the nation's early leading center of the abolitionist or anti-slavery movement. That was for a number of different reasons, including that Massachusetts had a significant small uh, free community of African-Americans. It was also true to the activism of some abolitionist leaders, including William Lloyd Garrison, um, a name that's probably familiar to many of you. Garrison was born in Newburyport, Massachusetts. And in 1831, he moved to Boston and established a newspaper called The Liberator. And The Liberator newspaper was dedicated to ending slavery in the United States and also dedicated to equality uh, among the races. So, and Garrison was a true radical, a true revolutionary. He pursued equality for men, as for women as well as for men, and for blacks as well as whites. And he worked very closely with the African American community in Boston. A number of people joined with Garrison's movement, including, as I mentioned, a number of women whom he encouraged. Um, that was a very um, extraordinary undertaking for women in that era. Women were supposed to be home confined to the domestic sphere. This is, of course, an idealized version of white middle class or even upper class life. Women were not supposed to be illiterate. You can see here in the foreground a little girl reading with her brother looking over her shoulder. Um, but women were supposed to be guardians of the domestic sphere, dedicated to taking care of the home, the husband, and the children. I, I'm so much, Barbara. Can I interrupt real quick? Sure. Um, we're having a little difficulty seeing um, where it says give subtitles a try. Yeah, I was trying to get it? rid of that. How do I? Oh, you got it. Okay. Sorry. I'm so sorry. Okay. Can you now? Oh, see, now it's now it's making a subtitle. Uh, maybe I should not use slideshow. Whoops. Actually, I'm try pressing where it says use. Oh, there we go. All right, now I'm not seeing anything. My whole screen. Whoops. Oh, yeah, uh, we're we're seeing your whole whole screen on our end. All right, let me see if I can. But now it's uh, a subtitle is being recorded on my screen. Is that true on your screen? Uh, we're seeing that as well, but we are seeing your full slide, so it's uh, much more clear now. All right, then we'll just let it be like this. All right, so, thank you. I'm sorry about that. I've never had this happen before. I've never been offered uh, the subtitles. Um, two of the women who began to work with William Lloyd Garrison were Mariah Weston Chapman and Mariah Stewart. The name that we know as Maria was often pronounced Mariah back then. Um, Mariah Stewart, unfortunately, there was no surviving image of her. But Mariah Stewart was an African-American woman who began working with William Lloyd Garrison on the Liberator newspaper and also began speaking out in the African-American community in Boston against slavery and against racism. Um, another very important woman was Mariah Weston Chapman, a white woman, because one of the things that Garrison understood was that to try to build a movement to oppose slavery you couldn't just have a newspaper and give and do writing. You had to actually organize people. He was very forward thinking. And Mariah Weston Chapman worked to organize women into what were called female anti-slavery societies. Small groups of women, friends and neighbors who would come together and talk about the evils of slavery and ideally sign petitions, which was under the American Constitution, one of the only political rights, arguably the only political right available to women of that era. These brave men and women who worked in the anti-slavery movement were very unpopular in that era. It's important to remember, this is now the early 1830s. 
in northern states like Massachusetts, people were proud that they no longer had slavery. Slavery, as you may know, had ended in Massachusetts back in 1783. But they were also, by and large, content to allow slavery to exist as it did in the South. Not only did they not really care for the most part, but also, as you may know, the North benefited tremendously economically from ties between the North and the South, the so-called alliance of the Lords of the Lash in the South and the Lords of the Loom in the North. And factories that did things like turn slave grow, slave picked cotton owned by white plantation owners uh, into cloth made many Northern fortunes. So this very small abolitionist movement persevered and began to grow very slowly during the 1830s. A turning point came, I argue in my book, in the mid 1830s due to the efforts of these two women that you may have heard of, Angelina and Sarah Grimke. They are not that well known, but there was a wonderful historical novel, The Invention of Wings, that came out not many years ago about the Grimke sisters. The Grimke sisters were very unusual followers of William Lloyd Garrison because they were actually from the South. They grew up in this home in Charleston, South Carolina. They were the daughters of a wealthy slave owning family. And Angelina and Sarah Grimke, one of the older sisters, Sarah, traveled with her father to Philadelphia where he went to seek medical treatment. And she became influenced by the abolitionist community in Philadelphia, led by, among other people, a woman, a Quaker woman named Lucretia Mott. And after the death of her father, Sarah, along with her younger sister, Angelina Grimke, moved to Philadelphia. They joined a female anti-slavery society led by Lucretia Mott. And they wrote a letter in 1835 to William Lloyd Garrison, praising the work that he was doing. Garrison realized how wonderful it would be if he could recruit the Grimke sisters to come and speak out against the evils of slavery and share their observations. Yes, of course they were white and had their perspective of white wealthy slave owners, not of enslaved, but remember this is during the mid 1830s. It's years before some of our best well-known self-emancipated African-Americans like Frederick Douglass had emerged on the scene. So William Lloyd Garrison arranged for the Grimke sisters to be trained as anti-slavery agents or lecturers, which they did. And in the summer of 1837, oops, I'm gonna wait. In the summer of 1837, organized by Mariah Weston Chapman, the Grimke sisters embarked on a speaking tour throughout Massachusetts. They were asked to go and speak to small gatherings of women to talk about the evils of slavery from their own perspective and to ask women to sign anti-slavery petitions. And they did so. And as they traveled around Massachusetts in the summer of 1837, men began to come to their talks as well. Now, men may have come for a variety of dif different reasons, to support them, to mock them out of curiosity, out of boredom. Remember, lectures in that era were a popular form of entertainment. It doesn't really matter. What does matter is that men as well as women begin to attend their talks, which begin to grow and attract sizable audiences. And that concerned many conservatives in Massachusetts and none more so than the conservative and very influential congregational ministers. And as the Grimke sisters were on their speaking tour in the summer of 1837, the congregational ministers wrote a powerful letter criticizing them that they asked every congregational minister to read one Sunday from their pulpits. And the letter said in part that when a woman assumes the place and tone of a man as a public reformer, her character becomes unnatural and the way is opened for degeneracy and ruin. Powerful, powerful words. Um, I sometimes think a picture is still worth a thousand words. And what did they mean by degeneracy and ruin? I think they meant something like this. The fear they told men that life as they knew it would be turned upside down, topsy-turvy. So here in this cartoon, for example, you have a woman putting on traveling clothes, getting into a coach driven by a woman. And her husband is the one stuck at home, doing the sewing, tending the baby. And in case you haven't fully grasped the point, even a servant has been affected and a male servant who would normally be doing other sorts of work 
has been demoted to doing laundry in the home. And this would continue to be a theme throughout the entire women's rights movement, the fear that if women had rights and particularly the right to vote, that life as men knew it would be threatened, would be turned upside down. It's a very important point to keep in mind. The congregational ministers, of course, expected the Grimke sisters to be intimidated, to sit down and be quiet. I am sure every one of you knows what happened next. They did no such thing. They continued to speak out. And in addition to continuing to stand behind the podium, they also picked up their pens. And they wrote a series of public letters that were published in the anti-slavery press in which they pointed out their right to speak out on important political issues like slavery. And Sarah, for her part, wrote in one of her letters that there are a few things which present greater obstacles to the improvement and elevation of woman to her appropriate sphere, right? Note, not the domestic sphere, but her appropriate sphere, the laws that she's had no voice in establishing. And Angelina, for her part, said, I contend that woman has just as much right to sit in solemn council in conventions, conferences, associations, and assemblies as man, just as much right to sit in the presidential chair of the United States. Really remarkable statements from these two women in 1837. After the Grimke sisters broke that ground, a number of women began to join them in speaking out against slavery and also very importantly for our purposes in defending a woman's right to do so probably none more significantly than Lucy Stone of Massachusetts. Lucy Stone was born in West Brookfield, Massachusetts in Worcester County in 1818, a literate farm girl, determined not to marry when she finished schooling at about age 16, she became a primary school teacher in a rural schoolhouse, which is one of the very few occupations available to young women like she. But Stone was desperate to continue her education and by working as a teacher and saving money slowly, at age 25, she was able to travel to Ohio and enter Oberlin College. And if any of you are familiar with Oberlin College of Ohio, you know that it itself was opened as an experiment dedicated to educating women as well as men and blacks as well as whites. And Lucy Stone was at Oberlin College from 1843 till 1847. And while she was there, she had the opportunity to hear from a number of anti-slavery spokespersons, including Frederick Douglass, Abby Kelly Foster, also of Worcester County, um, Frederick Douglass, who by then had arrived on the scene, William Lloyd Garrison, and others. And when Lucy Stone graduated in 1847, she returned to Massachusetts and became an anti-slavery lecturer, as the Grimke sisters had been, and also delivered wholly separate lectures on the subject of women's rights. That's a very, very quick introduction to what I call the first 10 years of the movement. Um, my book and other books tell a lot more about it. But what I wanted to convey to you was A, that Seneca Falls, 1848, is a, a prior story, um, and some of the lessons learned from different aspects of the movement. The importance of speaking truth to power the importance of challenging injustices of the status quo, and the importance of persisting, which given that the woman's suffrage story takes almost a century is going to be a consistent theme this afternoon. I'm now gonna talk about the organized woman's suffrage movement. We're gonna to turn to Seneca Falls on the next slide, but first I'm gonna tell you that the organized woman's suffrage movement, I argue, was actually launched here in Massachusetts in Worcester in 1850. So let's talk about that. So the Seneca Falls Convention, as you all know, took place in Seneca Falls, New York, upstate New York, not far from where uh, Cornell University and Ithaca College are on the Finger Lakes in the summer of 1848. That convention came about because Elizabeth Cady Stanton, who was from upstate New York, although she had spent a number of years actually living in Boston and become well known uh, and connected within the abolitionist community. She and her husband had moved to Seneca Falls. They were in the midst of having what would ultimately be seven children. Um, and Lucretia Mott had a sister that lived in Seneca Falls. 
And that summer, Lucretia Mott traveled to Seneca Falls to visit her sister. And Mott, Mott's sister, Stanton, and two other women got together one July day in 1848. And they talked about the Grimke sisters speaking tour uh, from 10 years earlier. They talked about Lucy Stone. They talked about the new spirit that was abroad in the land. And they decided the time was ripe to do something radical and extraordinary. And that was to call together a convention to discuss the subject of women's rights. And they did so. It was a local convention. They gave 10 days notice. It was advertised only in the local papers. But remarkably, 300 people, mostly women and some men, congregated in Seneca Falls in this Wesleyan Methodist chapel, which was owned by an abolitionist-minded congregation, for two days in the summer of 1848. Very famously, before that convention, Elizabeth Cady Stanton drafted a document that we know as the Declaration of Sentiments. And using the American Declaration of Independence as a model, Elizabeth Cady Stanton laid out many of the wrongs done by men to women by the laws that exist and made claims for rights. Um, a broad range of rights, the rights to divorce, the right to child custody, the right to own property, the right to keep one wages, the right to jury service, and most significantly for our purposes, the right to vote. So Seneca Falls was indeed a very important moment, but it didn't start a movement because after the Seneca Falls Convention, everybody went home. And how to get things to carry on and continue was in fact, very much on Elizabeth Cady Stanton's mind. And a couple of months later, she wrote to one of her abolitionist friends, Amy Post, a letter in which she said in part, she was frustrated by the fact, how do you build a movement? How do you carry forward the momentum? And she said, do you not think we ought to have an agent to travel all over the country and lecture on this subject? Lucy Stone, I think, might be engaged for this purpose. That didn't happen, but I put this up there to show you both how famous Lucy Stone was just one year after her graduation from Oberlin, and also to indicate what Stanton was thinking. That didn't happen. Lucy Stone did, was not recruited for that role. She continued uh, to do the speaking she had been doing. But what did happen is almost two years later, Lucy Stone and a number of her other allies in the young women's rights movement and the abolitionist movement decided that the time was ripe to call together what they called the first national women's rights convention. And they scheduled it for October, 1850 in Worcester, Massachusetts. So a few significant things. First of all, why Worcester? It was the home county of Lucy Stone. It was also a wealthy reform-minded city at that time. And it was a very important transportation crossroads, both north, south, and east, west. They called it the first national women's rights convention. First was very significant. They understood that they were building a movement, planning for the future. And they called it the first because before they went home, they wanted to make plans for a second and then a third and so forth. They called it national because they wanted to recruit people to come from different states. Now national meant Northern in that era. These were the same people that were also involved in the anti-slavery movement. The South obviously was opposed to the anti-slavery movement and certainly had no interest in women's rights, both because they were busy fighting any kind of reform that might give people more freedom. They of course wanted to defend slavery and they certainly were not interested in supporting any woman who were active in the anti-slavery movement. This convention in Worcester in October of 1850 was enormously successful. It was attended by nearly 1,000 people, primarily women, but also some men for two days. They came together, they discussed women's rights, they discussed changes they would like to see, uh, and very significantly, before it was over, they established a series of committees and made plans for there to be a second National Women's Rights Convention, also in Worcester the following year. At the Worcester Convention, um, most of the people involved in the women's rights movement in this era, and this is, we're going to talk about race throughout this afternoon, 
were mostly women like Lucy Stone. They were white, literate, native born and Protestant, but there were some exceptions from the very beginning of the movement. So for example, one of the women who attended the Worcester Convention was Sojourner Truth, a name I suspect is familiar to all of you. And of course, Truth herself was born in slavery in New York when New York State still had slavery. Uh, she was self-emancipated and she became a great advocate both for the end of slavery and for women's rights. After the Worcester Convention, <clears throat> there was, as you can see from this slide, a whole series of conventions held during the 1850s. The next one in Worcester, and then they began to hold some of these conventions in other Northern cities. So Syracuse, New York, Cleveland, Ohio, Philadelphia, Cincinnati, New York, and so forth. And you can see the conventions were held nearly every single year during the 1850s. Susan B. Anthony, who I haven't yet mentioned today, first appears on the scene. She did not attend the convention at Seneca Falls, even though many people think she did. She was uh, born actually in Massachusetts, as you may know, in Adams, but she was raised in upstate New York, uh, her family eventually settling in Rochester. And she attends the Syracuse Convention in 1852, <coughs> excuse me, held in upstate New York. Uh, and when she attends that convention in 1852, Susan B. Anthony is so inspired by it that she determines then and there to devote the rest of her life to the cause of women's rights. Another thing I wanna point out about these conventions is that at the outset, when you think about Seneca Falls and the first Worcester Convention, the menu of things that women were seeking was very broad, um, the rights that I mentioned a few moments ago. It continues to be broad, but over time, the focus begins to narrow on the right to vote, on suffrage as the cornerstone of other rights. And that's something we're gonna talk about more in a moment. Another thing that's very important to keep in mind when you're thinking about a movement like the women's rights movement or the women's suffrage movement that lasts nearly a century is that you always have to think about what else was going on in American history. And even though today, obviously, in this short period, we can't go into details. And it's very important, and most of you probably know this, that during the 1850s, as the small women's rights movement was beginning slowly to grow, attract more adherents, this is also the era when the nation is moving closer to civil war over the issue of slavery. And very soon after the New York Convention was held in 1860, Abraham Lincoln is elected president, Southern states begin to secede and civil war begins, as you know, in April of 1861. What are some of the lessons of this convention decade? The importance of organizing and educating. The movement was still small, but it began to have leadership and it was growing. And by 1860, Lucy Stone, Elizabeth Cady Stanton, and Susan B. Anthony, who was a brilliant organizer, were recognized as the trio at the leadership of the still young, still very new women's rights movement. We're now gonna to turn to the Civil War and I just wanna check in and make sure the slides are advancing properly, are they? <clears throat> so are you all seeing a slide that says Civil War? We are indeed, yes. Perfect, okay. I'm sorry about the distraction of the words at the bottom of the screen, but as long as you can see everything. Um, we don't have time to dwell on the Civil War. Officially, the women's rights movement was put on hold during the Civil War. So Stanton, Anthony, and Lucy Stone said that they needed to put their young movement on hold during the Civil War so that women could devote all of their energy, all of their efforts to supporting the Union War effort. And they did so. And they supported the Union War effort in a variety of ways as the sketch by Winslow Homer demonstrates. But one thing I wanted to point out is, you're probably aware that during wartime historically, women's rights have often advanced. And that was true during the Civil War as well, because women gained new skills that would prove to be very useful in the decades following the end of the war. So women became nurses, for example. They managed homes and farms and businesses while their husbands and fathers and sons were away fighting. They organized what were called sanitary societies where they gathered provisions 
uh, or made provisions and then distributed them to soldiers at hospitals and soldiers in the field. And these skills would become very important after the war because there would be many women with new skills that they had acquired. So the Civil War comes to an end in 1865. And at the end of the war, there is an enormous focus by the Republicans who for this brief window after the Civil War still control the Congress on the ballot. And the issue was expansion of the ballot and for whom. And Frederick Douglass had become a leading spokesperson during the Civil War for advocating for expansion of the ballot to black men because Frederick Douglass was among those who basically said that in a society like ours, there was no right that's really worth having, no right that really matters other than the right to vote. Because without the right to vote, you always have to ask for rights. You have to beg and plead for people to give them to you and then not take them away. But you have the right to vote, you never have to do that again because you can seize rights. The women's rights advocates like Stanton, Anthony, and Stone very much supported suffrage for the formerly enslaved, suffrage for all African-American men, but they wanted what they called universal suffrage, suffrage for all adults, regardless of race and regardless of gender. And they began a petition campaign like this one, and it's hard to see on your screen, but this petition for universal suffrage, the first four names, uh, so first four signatures, are Elizabeth Cady Stanton, Susan B. Anthony, Lucy Stone, and Lucy Stone's sister-in-law. That's what they hoped would happen. Um, there was debate and discussion of this for the first few years after the Civil War, and things came to a head at a new association, the American Equal Rights Association. This was the new name given to the women's rights conventions um, after the Civil War, when in May of 1869, there was a bitter schism or divide over the 15th Amendment. And the 15th Amendment, as you may know, is the amendment in our Constitution that grants voting rights to African American men. And as there was the debate over this, Congress had said that they were not going to accept universal suffrage, that the highest priority in their mind was extending the ballot to African American men. And Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Susan B. Anthony objected very strongly to that. And they did so in very racist terms that often come as a shock to modern audiences who are used to thinking of Stanton and Anthony as pure heroes. So Stanton, for example, said, I will not support, and here she's using derogatory nicknames of immigrants from various parts of the world. I will not support Patrick and Sambo and Hans and Young Tung making laws for the daughters, and of course she means the white native born daughters of Jefferson, Hancock and Adams. And she accused politicians of degrading white women below, as she put it, unwashed and unlettered ditch diggers, boot blacks, butchers and barbers. Frederick Douglass retorted that he, can, that he must say, I don't see how any can, one can pretend there is the same urgency in giving the ballot to woman as to the Negro. The debate continued with Anthony supporting her friend Stanton and saying, if intelligence, justice, and morality are to have any precedence, precedence in government, let the question of woman be brought up first and that of the Negro last. And Lucy Stone sat and listened to this debate with dismay. She obviously very much wanted woman to be included, but she also understood the desire of Douglas and others to prioritize African-American men and she ultimately stood up and said, woman has an ocean of wrongs too deep for any plummet. And the Negro too has an ocean of wrongs that cannot be fathomed. I will be thankful in my soul if anybody can get out of the terrible pit of disenfranchisement. So Lucy Stone decided to support the 15th amendment. Stanton and Anthony refused to do so. The 15th amendment, as of course you know, was proposed by Congress ratified by three quarters of the states, becomes part of the United States Constitution. And as this was happening, a schism divided the former friends and allies who formed two competing suffrage associations. Anthony and Stanton formed the National Woman Suffrage Association based in New York. They wanted to pursue a federal amendment 
They began a newspaper called The Revolution, which lasted for two years and then ran out of money. And it was Lucy Stone who established what I argue was the more important organization during the 20 years of schism. 20 years later in 1890, as we'll talk about, these two organizations would reconcile. And we'll get to that in a few moments. Lucy Stone establishes the American Women's Suffrage Association based here in Boston. She established a newspaper called the Woman's Journal that was published every single week for 50 years from 1870 till 1920. It was the communications vehicle, the hub as it were, of the women's suffrage movement. She was inclusive. She welcomed blacks and men to join the suffrage movement. And she came up with the strategy that turned out to be the successful strategy. Because what Lucy Stone said was, of course we want a federal amendment. We all want a federal amendment in franchising women. But she said, how are we going to get it? We can't just go to Congress and say we want it. We have to have a plan. And she said the only way to get it, and this turned out to be the strategy that ultimately worked, was to do the labor intensive work of campaigning across the country and trying to persuade state by state states to change their constitutions to enfranchise women so that certain states would elect congressmen and senators who were beholden to women voters. And once there was a critical mass of congressmen and senators beholden to women voters, Stone said, we would be able to get the two thirds support of the House and Senate required for an amendment and ratification by three quarters of the state. She under, of the states. She understood that it was a long game, that it would take a long time, but her strategy turned out to be the one that worked. Why, I hope you're all sitting there saying to yourselves, why if what Barbara is saying is true, don't I know this? Why don't I know all about Lucy Stone, the Women's Journal, the American Women's Suffrage Association, the Worcester Convention, and so forth? And the answer is so important to keep in mind and that is, what is history? You know, history is, of course, not necessarily what happened. History is the story we are told of what happened. And during the 20 years of schism between 1870 and 1890, one of the very most important things that happened, led by Anthony and Stanton, is that they decided to write a history of the young woman's suffrage movement. They wanted to write for the future, to write for young women, to write for people they hoped would, they would attract, and to also write their own version of history uh, into the narrative. And they wrote a history that elevated Seneca Falls, where of course Elizabeth Cady Stanton was a leader, uh, to the origin story of the movement. They largely wrote out Lucy Stone. She of course was at this point their rival, uh, their opponent. Um, and history of women's suffrage. This, these first three volumes that they wrote during these 20 years of what ultimately becomes a six volume work still shapes the narrative that we remember. Lucy Stone was bitterly critical of them for writing history of women's suffrage. She said it was premature and that a history of a movement shouldn't be written until it succeeded. Um, that may or may not be the case, but what is certainly true is that the history that Anthony and Stanton wrote is became the dominant narrative the way we remember that history now. And during the Q&A, maybe that's one of the subjects we'll pursue. What are some of the very important lessons of this brief uh, section? The importance of thinking always, whenever you're studying history and thinking about the past, of who wrote the history. The importance of picking up the pen and writing down the story. The importance of considering biases of those who narrate history and the importance of always questioning dominant narratives. So what was in fact Lucy Stone and her wing busy doing during these 20 years? Um, for purposes of this talk, since my book really focuses in Massachusetts, I'm gonna tell you really about the Lucy Stone wing um, during these 20 years. The first thing I wanna say, I told you earlier that you always have to think about what else was going on in history. And the Civil War, the reformist era of abolitionism, the Civil War gives way after the war to the Gilded Age. 
and the Republican Party ceases to be a party of reform and becomes really a party of business, a party of conservatism. The Democratic Party, meanwhile, uh, which is the party of the white South, uh, in the North is the party that welcomes immigrants. It's a party of the working class, but it's not a party that was amenable to reforms like women's rights. First of all, they associated it with the hated Republican Party since these women were originally from the former incarnation of the Republican Party. And also many of the immigrant groups that flocked to the Democratic Party think Catholics from Ireland, Catholics from Italy, Eastern European Jews and others were themselves traditional patriarchal, uh, from traditional patriarchal societies and were not interested in a reform like women's rights. So the Gilded Age, these final decades of the 19th century were a de very difficult time for a reform movement like women's rights. Um, cartoons like this were very popular. This is really just like the cartoon I showed you at the beginning, except the clothing is slightly more modern. But again, the sense implanting fear in men. And of course, the only way women were going to gain the right to vote is if men voted to share power with them. Again, pointing out to men that life as they knew it would be turned topsy-turvy, upside down, if women had the vote. The Supreme Court got involved in 1873 uh, in a case involving whether or not women had the right to practice law, uh, a justice noting that the domestic sphere is that which properly belongs to the domain and functions of womanhood. So what was the American Women's Suffrage Association busy doing during these 20 years? First of all, it's national as well as state offices were on Park Street, just steps from the Massachusetts State House. And Julia Ward Howe, who had become very famous during the Civil War when she penned the lyrics to Battle Hymn of the Republic, becomes one of Lucy Stone's closest allies and the head of the Massachusetts Women's Suffrage Association. The Women's Journal looked like this. Later on, as we get closer to 1920, the print gets a little bigger and there will be a few cartoons, but this is just to give you a sense of what the Women's Journal newspaper that was published every single week on Park Street looked like. Um, I mentioned to you that Lucy Stone welcomed Blacks as well as Whites into the American Women's Suffrage Association. And there were a number of very important uh, African-American men and women who joined with her, probably locally none more significant than Josephine St. Pierre Ruffin. Uh, not only did Josephine St. Pierre Ruffin join the American Women's Suffrage Association and the Massachusetts Women's Suffrage Association, but she then also started a club of African-American women uh, based in Boston called the Women's Era Club and even began a newspaper. And in 1895, Ruffin calls together a convention in Boston of other clubs of African-American women. Uh, and that's the genesis of what was known as the National Association of Colored Women and other organizations that then would continue on. It's so very, very significant. Um, one of the other things that turned out to be brilliant about Lucy Stone's state-by-state -state strategy, even though she could not have predicted this when she came up with it in 1870, um, Stone and her allies, of course, expected that states that had been important in abolitionism, like Massachusetts, would be the first to enfranchise women. But that turned out not to be the case for the reasons I mentioned about the Gilded Age, the Republican Party very quickly after the Civil War ceased to be a party of reform and becomes a party of conservatism. And it was actually in certain Western states that women's suffrage found its first successes. So the first four states to enfranchise women were actually Wyoming, Colorado, Utah, and Idaho, which often in my experience comes as a tremendous surprise to audiences. Um, why was that? Well, obviously every one of these territories and then states has its own unique story. But I think if you were to just give a few general comments, it would be that these were new regions of the country that wanted women to come and settle, that respected women the way they worked alongside men. And they didn't have conservative institutions like banks and manufacturing fortunes dominating public and political life. One of the other things that the American Women's Suffrage Association led by Lucy Stone did that was positively brilliant is when she realized how difficult it was going to be to try to win suffrage in states like Massachusetts and other more established states, 
she came up with what was called a partial suffrage strategy. And what she basically said was, look, if we can't get a state constitution amended to fully enfranchise women, maybe we can get the legislature to pass laws to enfranchise women a little bit, get our foot in the door, and then over time, we'll be able to get enfranchised more. And that, in fact, turned out to be what happened. And so states like Massachusetts and certain other ones enfranchised women first to vote for school committee elections. And as you can imagine, legislatures were ultimately able to be persuaded in many states to enfranchise women to vote for school committee because that was so consistent with a woman's traditional role in raising and educating children. There were then efforts made in a variety of states to enfranchise women to vote in city and town elections. Sometimes they failed. It failed, for example, in Massachusetts in 1895. But again, these attempts were important in continuing to spread the word, lay the groundwork for ultimate success. It was a very hard, very long battle. Finally, in 1890, after 20 difficult years during the Gilded Age, Stone, Stanton, and Anthony were persuaded to reconcile and form one organization that was known that they named the National American Woman Suffrage Association. The movement to make them reconcile was actually led by members of the next generation, younger women who basically said to their elders, we have only won the right to vote in four states. Young women don't understand why there are two competing organizations. The 15th Amendment has been part of the Constitution for 20 years. You need to get past your rivalry and reconcile. And one of the young women who was very important in this was actually Lucy Stone's daughter, Alice Stone Blackwell, who becomes a leader in the suffrage movement. So in 1890, they reconciled and formed the National American Woman Suffrage Association. Lucy Stone, however, dies three years later in 1893 of cancer. Elizabeth Cady Stanton goes off to England in the early 1890s to live with one of her daughters who lived abroad, her daughter Harriet. And it's Anthony, who was a brilliant organizer, as I mentioned, who takes the helm and leads the National American Woman Suffrage Association from 1890 till 1900 when she retires. And then Anthony lives on till 1906. And her leadership of this new organization and particularly leading it into the turn of the century to the 20th century is one of the other reasons why Susan B. Anthony became so well known and so famous. She was really a brilliant leader. What are some of the lessons of these 20 years from 1870 to 1890? The importance of tailoring strategies as necessary, like Lucy Stone and the American Woman Suffrage Association did, their state-by-state -state campaigns, their focus on the West when those proved, fruit, proved fruitful, the partial suffrage step strategy, the importance of being resourceful, being creative, the ability to pivot, Again, the importance of persisting, as I said, a common theme throughout, um, and the importance of having confidence no matter how difficult the going is, and this is something I've certainly thought a lot about in recent years, having the confidence that somehow, if you work hard enough, that justice will someday prevail. We're now going to turn, I'm just going to check the time here because I can't see it on my screen. I think we're doing fine. Um, we're now going to turn briefly, because I want to leave plenty of time to, for questions, to the 20th century. The years between 1900, when Susan B. Anthony steps down, and 1920, when the 19th Amendment is finally adopted, so much happens so fast that it would be impossible for me to cover it in any kind of, of single lecture. But what I want to do is just introduce to you some of the people and some of the themes that will make success possible, and then we'll talk about it, as I said, during Q&A. The first thing I'm going to mention is that we have a new era. The Gilded Age happily is left behind, and the era called the Progressive Era between about 1895 and the first uh, 20 years of the, or so, or maybe the first 15 years uh, of the 20th century, uh, it, the Gilded Age is supplanted by the Progressive Era. And the Progressive Era, just as its name suggests, is an era of progress. And during the Progressive Era, there was broadspread public agreement, even if there was disagreement over the tactics, 
that the nation as a whole had to address some of the worst challenges of the industrialized air, industrialization of the Gilded Age. Things like overcrowded cities, unsafe factories, child labor, extreme government corruption. So any era in which reform was popular would be good for a reform like women's rights. It's also very important to keep in mind though, the progressive era was no exception to some of the dominant stains uh, in American history, the persistence of nativism, xenophobia, and racism. And those would plague the women's suffrage movement as well as any other movements. There were new social currents during the progressive era, a lot of new inventions, uh, that led to changes in women's lives. The bicycle, for example, which led to clothing reforms, exercise, the ability of women to get around independently. Susan B. Anthony famously said that she felt that the bicycle did more to liberate women than any other single thing. There were many new jobs for women as a result of new inventions, the telephone, the typewriter, more women, the number of men in higher education and finishing high school obviously continued to vastly exceed the number of women, but there were more women gaining high, earning high school diplomas and college degrees. So there were a lot of changes. And there were a whole series of new leaders who would take over after Susan B. Anthony. And I'm just going to introduce some of them with again a particular focus on some of the outstanding leaders from Massachusetts. Um, Carrie Chapman Catt, I do need to mention, even though she's not from Massachusetts, um, she was from Iowa and Wisconsin, but Carrie Chapman Catt is Susan B. Anthony's handpicked successor to succeed her in 1900. And Carrie Chapman Catt was another brilliant organizer and also a great fundraiser who created what we now call the Society Plan, which included reaching out to wealthy widows and heiresses to donate money to the women's suffrage movement that would help it succeed in over these next 20 years. Another very important thing that Carrie Chapman Catt sought to do was improve the image of the suffrage movement. Think of those cartoons I showed you earlier. One of my favorite ones from the early part of the century is this one showing a suffragist who looks an awful lot like Susan B. Anthony as an unattractive masculine woman wearing uh, essentially male's clothing with a skirt. Um, and Carrie Chapman Catt sought out, set out to improve the image of the movement to make it something that women would want to join, to make it attractive, to make it fashionable. And one of her allies in this was a Massachusetts woman named Maud Wood Park, uh, who had gone to Radcliffe College, graduated in 1898, joined the suffrage movement, was quite upset at how apathetic uh, and indifferent many of her college classmates were to the suffrage movement. And she founded with a friend an organization called the College Equal Suffrage League. And that proved to be so successful in attracting young college educated women to the movement that Carrie Chapman Catt soon asked Maud Wood Park to establish, to travel throughout the country and establish college equal suffrage leagues all across the nation, which she did. And that brought a lot of new woman, new energy, and sometimes new money into the movement. Um, another very important woman, local woman was Florence Luscombe. Floris Luscombe was a big believer in what was called open air meetings. In other words, she said for decades, what women suffragists had been doing was having meetings in parlors and halls where people who already agree with them come. And she said, what we need to do is take the movement out of the parlor and into the streets. In other words, stand on street corners, pass out newspapers, go to town greens, outside factory gates, bring the movement to the people. Um, one of her big allies in this was actually Elizabeth Cady Stanton's daughter, Harriet Stanton Blatch, the one who had lived in London, but was now back in the United States. Um, this is just one picture. This is when the era of parades began. I'm sure many of you are familiar with pictures of per suffrage parades. Um, this particular shot I just like because it shows college women marching in a suffrage parade. But there were parades in many different cities led by New York initially, uh, but there were also a couple of very major parades, several major parades in Massachusetts, um, as well as other states. And this 
proved to be so successful. This might be my very favorite cartoon from the entire suffrage movement from 1911 by a man named Boardman Robinson um, called The Type Has Changed. And what he is doing is illustrating the success of suffragists in changing the image of the movement, in um, reinventing it so that suffragists were no longer the figure on the left, the sort of masculinized, unattractive spinster who would want to be like that. And instead, suffragists were now attractive, fashionable, a movement that everybody should want to join. Um, the movement also becomes more diverse. It welcomes, for example, working class women into it. Mary Kenny O'Sullivan is just one of many, but she was a particularly important figure because she is a founder of the Women's Trade Union League, which helped to organize working class women and to persuade them that they would be assisted by the ballot because with the ballot, they would be able to have influence over things like wage, the hours they worked, their wages, factory conditions, and so forth. Another one of my favorite um, local um, daughters of Irish immigrants is Margaret Foley, who was a big adventurer. And here she is uh, shown going up in a hot air balloon at a fair in Lawrence, where she's gonna sprinkle votes for leaflets, uh, flyers down on the crowd. So you can see these new women brought new ideas, new energy um, into the movement that would prove to be tremendously important. Um, but it's also very important to keep in mind that although they were more welcoming to white immigrant groups, the suffrage movement was dominated very much by white women. Um, they focused on gender, not on race. This is another cartoon by Boardman Robinson titled, Just Like the Men. And you can see a white woman carrying a votes for a woman sign, pushing away an African-American woman carrying a votes for a woman sign. Why were the suffragists so focused on gender only and not inclusive of race? Of race? Um, probably two primary reasons. The first, of course, is their own racism, the racism in our society at large that they simply were reflecting. Um, there was also a practical political reason as well that's very important to keep in mind. And that is that Carrie Chapman Catt and other leaders understood that ultimately, if they were going to get a women's suffrage amendment added to the Constitution, they would need support from two thirds of the House and two thirds of the Senate and ratification by three quarters of the states, as I mentioned. And they understood that to get this, they were going to need the support of some from the South. So they chose to put on blinders to cancel out the issue of race. There was no intersectionality in their minds and their focus was on gender, not on race. Now, having said that, I will say that there were, despite that, a tremendous number of wonderful African-American women working very hard for both women's rights and the rights for African-Americans all across the country. Um, two very important women in Massachusetts, both of whom have schools named after them, Mariah Baldwin, an educator for whom the Baldwin School in Cambridge is named, Florida Ruffin Ridley, one of the children of Josephine St. Pierre Ruffin, also an educator, and a Brookline, Massachusetts school was recently renamed a couple of years ago. They've been named after a man who turned out uh, to have been a slave owner, and there is now the Ridley School in Brookline. So African-American women, despite the fact that they were largely excluded from the movement, continued to work very hard nevertheless, but they were often working on a parallel track would probably be the best way to put it. Um, another leader I just want to mention very briefly, um, not from Massachusetts, but very important name that may be familiar to many of you is Alice Paul. Um, Alice Paul had uh, was from the United States, had gone to England. Um, I haven't had time today to talk about the international aspects of the movement. We can do that during the Q&A if you wish. Um, but Alice Paul had gone to England and become very influenced by what she saw as a more militant wing of the women's suffrage movement in England. And when she came back to the United States, she was determined, along with her good friend from England, Lucy Burns, to revitalize or re-energize in a different way the National American Women's Suffrage Movement by, as she said, emphasizing deeds, not words. 
and her emphasis on deeds. She was the one who did things like organized pickets in front of the White House, um, pictures you're probably familiar with, led to a rupture with Carrie Chapman Catt and the National American Woman Suffrage Association and Alice Paul in 1916, there would be another schism and she would form a small uh, group called the National Women's Party, but that got tremendous publicity and was very active due to its high profile activities like picketing in front of the White House. Uh, the National American Woman Suffrage Association did not do things like picket, but it was very active by this point in time in lobbying Congress. Um, it had realized that a number of states, I haven't had a time to go into this, but a number of additional states had enfranchised women. They took the battle to Washington and Maud Wood Park, who had founded the College Equal Suffrage League, becomes the lead lobbyist in Washington for the National American Women's Suffrage Association. Um, and then I'm just going to end with a nod to World War I, um, because World War I, like the Civil War, like World War II, led to expanded new roles for women. Woodrow Wilson, who was president during World War I, had also promised when he brought this nation into war that he was going to make the world safe for democracy. And the combination of the long decades of state-by-state -state campaignings of the National American Women's Suffrage Associations, the raising of money, the changing of image, the new energy of college women, the militant pickets led by Alice Paul, and World War I would come together, and I know I'm just rushing so we can get through this, um, to lead to passage of the 19th Amendment in 1920. So these last years that I've gone through very, very quickly, I just want to call your attention to the importance of alliances, the importance of money, and to remember that the women's suffrage story, you have to think of as a story, warts and all. It was complicated, it was contradictory, it's not always pretty. And the focus was always by the leaders on gender alone, not on race and gender. It was not an intersectional movement. I mean, there were a few people who were intersectional, but the leaders were not. Um, the 19th Amendment, of course, is finally passed. It's adopted in August of 2020. Um, women across the country are able to go and vote in November 20, uh, 1920, but it is important to keep in mind that this was an American story, which means, of course, it was a limited success. Uh, the 19th Amendment was, in fact, a great victory, but it was an incomplete victory, and people were left out. So Black women, for example, were no sooner officially enfranchised under the 19th Amendment than they were immediately stripped of the right to vote by the same Jim Crow laws that had stripped African-American men in the South of their right to vote. And that would of course not be rectified until 1965 with the Voting Rights Act. And here we are in 2021, refighting that very same battle as I'm sure you all know. Native Americans were still left out in 1920. Asian Americans were left out. And the struggle for voting rights, as I said, is not history. This is not something that lives on a bookshelf. Um, it is something that is very, very much alive in our world today. So I am going to stop there and um, open it up for not just questions, but also comments. Um, I have found with my various audiences that there are just as many comments as questions. And um, I'm very interested in hearing those as well. Also, the last thing I will just say is I covered a lot of material to give you this broad overview. Um, but feel free in your questions to ask things that go beyond material that I covered, and I will do the best I can to try to answer. And thank you. Thank you, Barbara. Very interesting. Uh, well said. I used to teach history, and people would, some of my students would say, but it sounds so boring. I said, no, it's a story. And, uh, and I really began to appreciate their commentary and adjusted my teaching to make sure that they got some enjoyment out of what they were hearing and learning. And I think a lot of us got uh, that from what you just presented. So thank you very much. Uh, one question, did married women have as much success or had much success in getting their husbands to support their struggle in this fight to get the uh, right to vote? Well, that's a great question. I mean, ultimately, every place that women gained the right to vote and all this, you know, whether it was for school committees, city and town suffrage, state by state, and ultimately the 19th Amendment, it was always men who had to make the decision. 
So women always had to reach out to men, always had to persuade men. Um, I think it's fair to say that you know, some women were able to do it more easily than others. When you look at women themselves who were leaders in the suffrage movement, so of course these are the activists, um, they fall into categories. Uh, many of them had men who were very supportive of their work, otherwise they wouldn't have been able to do it. Many of them remained single. Some of them were widows. Some of them um, lived in same-sex relationships. I mean, there was a wide range of lifestyles and a wide range of reactions from men. Um, but one of the things that women ultimately did in the 19 teens is they would ask all suffrage supporters, all women suffrage supporters to try to get at least one man to go to the polls to support women's suffrage because they had to translate their support into votes somehow. So that was one of their goals. Thank you. Uh, one comment was this person was surprised that wealthy women married at all. Uh, she says men controlled women's money and property. Why would wealthy women submit to control by men? Well, that's an interesting question because it is true that actually in this era, there were quite a number of wealthy heiresses and so forth who chose to stay single. So not all women wanted to get married, but I mean, many women were raised, of course, to think about that the ultimate success in life, the ultimate status, the ultimate thing they should want was marriage and a family. So most women did, um, did get married, uh, but there were quite a number who had the means who stayed single if they could. Good. Uh, another point was made that the election of 1876 had a huge impact on the end of Recon at the end of Reconstruction uh, and the Republican shift toward big business. How much did the end of Reconstruction and its aftermath impact the uh, viability of women's suffrage movement? So that's a wonderful question. So just for anybody who's not too familiar with this aspect of history, I mentioned in my talk that there was a brief moment in time after the Civil War when abolitionists and more radical Republicans still controlled Congress. That really had fully came to an end by 1876. And in the election of 1876, which was close and disputed, uh, one of the concessions made as the presidency was being decided was to fully pull federal troops out of the South and declare a full end to Reconstruction. And when that came to an end, there was no more any control to the extent there had been for the preceding 10 years over white supremacy in the South. And so this was the rise of Jim Crow laws, of lynching, of all sorts of methods of intimidation, of land theft, all the things that we associated with the defeat of Reconstruction in the South. Um, it was significant in the North in that it was kind of a marker of the Gilded Age that wealthy Republicans in the North no longer cared about the South. They no longer viewed themselves as reformers who were going to save race relations in the country, that they were going to focus on making fortunes. Industrialization after the Civil War had opened up the North for the biggest fortunes. I mean, think the Vanderbilts, the Carnegies, you know, all these other big names. Um, and so this is was sort of the peak of the Gilded Age. Why didn't the Equal Rights Amendment ever get ratified? Well, that's a wonderful question that really deals with where we are in 2021 as opposed to 1920. I'm happy to try to answer it, Will, if you don't mind my going a century later. Uh, so the Equal Rights Amendment, I mean, that is, you know, a whole separate course. Um, and maybe that would be a fun course to have one of these days. But the Equal Rights Amendment failed for a number of different reasons um, in the 1970s and 1980s. It was a child, and I don't know how to do this in just about three minutes, but I'll try. I'll look at my clock and talk for not more than two or three minutes about it. I mean, the ERA um, was proposed by Congress in 1972. It was sort of a child of the 1960s, of the anti-war movement, the civil rights movement, the emphasis on equality for women, and unfinished business. Women had been given or women had gained or earned the right to vote, um, but not equal rights under the law. Um, it failed in 1982, due in large part to a movement, a counter movement led by Phyllis Schlafly, uh, who set out to persuade women that they were protected by being denied equal rights, essentially, that somehow the Equal Rights Amendment would um, 
challenge the worthiness of being a stay-at-home mother, a housewife, and so forth. And she put fear into a lot of people that the way they had always lived would somehow be challenged. Abortion got folded into it. Um, so, and conservatism, and when, after Ronald Reagan became president in 1980, the, you know, defeat was, was on its way. It was officially defeated in 1982, but some of you may know that there's been a revival over these last few years, which is why this question is so interesting, um, because 35 states had ratified it by 1982, and of course you need 38, three quarters of the states, and three states ratified the Equal Rights Amendment in the last several years. And there is now a movement in Congress to remove the time limit that had put 1982 as the date by which it had to be ratified and to argue that these recent ratifications are somehow legitimate and valid. Um, the House, I believe, just voted to do that a couple of weeks ago. Uh, the Senate has not yet made that decision. And of course, if the Senate does, it would go before the Supreme Court. And given the current composition of the Supreme Court, I personally would not be optimistic, but optimism is a good thing if any of you would like to be optimistic. <laughs> so that's where we are and we'll see what happens. Thank you. Uh, question about the Iroquois culture of nonviolence and its respect for women. Did that have much of an influence on Elizabeth Cady Stanton and women of upstate New York? That is another great question. You know, well, the problem with a short talk is you have to leave so much out. So one of the things that a number of scholars in recent years, in particular a historian named Sally Wagner, but there are others, have really studied was Native American culture, the way in which it treated women, its matriarchal um, history and power. And she and others have argued that Elizabeth Cady Stanton, who was of course living in the Finger Lakes district, was very influenced by the Iroquois and other Native American um, groups. To what extent that influence really tilted Elizabeth Cady Stanton's thinking, I think is still something that historians are debating. And maybe something we have a clear answer to one of these days, but it is definitely a live and very interesting issue. And for people, as I, I mentioned Sally Wagner a couple of times, for people who are interested in reading more about her or pursuing it, she would probably be the first place that I would recommend that you start. Um, it's a very interesting, um, really fascinating question. Uh, Barbara, would you say something about the women who sincerely thought that the suffrage movement was really a big mistake? Well, that is, a, you know, all these questions, you're a wonderful group and every single question is, is a great question. Um, so, you know, what makes somebody opposed to change? Um, I mean, there's, there's a few complicated issues here because one of the things about women's rights movement, whether it's the ERA or suffrage, that distinguishes it in large part from other civil rights movements is the opposition from within the group that it's trying to benefit. For example, not all African-Americans support rights for African-Americans. Not all gay people support rights for gay people. But the number of opponents are far, far fewer in these other groups. Women are noteworthy for having so many people oppose the extension of their own rights. And why that is, is an issue that sociologists and anthropologists and psychologists and others you know, grapple with and still try to understand. And you know, I think that the reasons are, you know, part, some would say it's lack of consciousness raising, that people just don't understand the limits of the life they leave. You know, it's like Ruth Bader Ginsburg quoting Sarah Grimke, you know, saying that women are living in a gilded cage. Um, this notion, Phyllis Schlafly, you know, was brilliant at emphasizing this, claiming that women were protected living on a pedestal with chivalrous men looking out for them and supporting them and all these things. And other women, the pro-ERA people saying, don't you understand that this pedestal that they're putting you on or that they claim they're putting you on is a cage where you're locked in. So I think it's just, you know, such a different in perspective and how you convince people that their rights, you know, are are not being met. It's part of why Betty Friedan's book in 1963, The Feminine Mystique, was so powerful, because she, in a very clear vocabulary, was able to describe what many people felt 
but didn't realize they were feeling until she said it. So it is a, a complicated struggle that I think would be even harder for us to understand looking back, except that the ERA is such a live example today of people claiming that the way it's always been is the way it always should be. Um, just one other quick comment, and I know you have more questions, is um, Lucy Stone was very aware of this from the very beginning. And in 1855, at the Fifth uh, Women's Rights Convention, she gave this wonderful speech in which she basically said, my goal in life is going to be to make every woman feel disappointed with their lot in life. And once they feel disappointed enough, then they will want to make change. Uh, Barbara, did the early Western states which passed women's right to vote also exclude African-Americans, Native Americans, Asian Americans? Uh, it depended on the state. Um, you know, it, it really depended on the history of the individual state. Um, Asian Americans were generally, to the best of my knowledge, and I am not an expert on this, I think they were pretty much excluded across the board because the Asian Exclusion Act prevented Asian immigrants from being naturalized. So I don't think that any state could have um, trumped that. Um, whether or not African American, well, African American men were allegedly given the right to vote under the 15th Amendment. So it all depended on what specific laws individual states have. Some of the Western states were very, were really very progressive, but there were also other restrictions of voting rights that I didn't have a chance to go into today, like think literacy tests, think poll taxes, um, residency requirements. So you really have to do an in-depth investigation of each of the individual states to figure out um, where they fell across the board. Well, Barbara, you, you showed some interesting cartoons about uh, women's dress and uh, men uh, taking care of the children, sewing. Uh, did the fight for women's suffrage, uh, did that influence the way women changed their uh, dress pattern? Well, yes, in many different times. So first of all, some of you may be familiar with the term called the bloomers. Um, that was a, a, an item of clothing um, named after its founder, Amelia Bloomer, in the early 1850s, which is really very conservative when you look at it. It's basically dresses that were ankle length as opposed to floor length and big billowy pants, but they were much more comfortable. Um, and bloomers were very quickly embraced by Lucy Stone and Elizabeth Cady Stanton and others, but they met with such derision and they were such a distraction that they decided to abandon them so that they could focus on suffrage and other legal changes because rather than focus on fashion and the, um, the disputes over it, because even many of their adherents um, didn't support the bloomers. So changes in fashion would continue though to always be a topic of conversation. But I think it's fair to say that in some ways the bicycle probably made those changes occur most efficiently and effectively because the bicycle craze uh, swept across the nation. But one of the things to just keep in mind, and I, I tried to mention this in the talk, but you know, again, time interferes, is that there were so many changes in women's lives going on at the turn of the century. I mean, electric lights, the bicycle, the new jobs, education, people moving to the suburbs, people living in the cities, leaving farms. I mean, all these things contributed in different ways to the women's suffrage movement. And to really tease out each one is a wonderful undertaking. It's just very time consuming because you have to look at every different, you know, every different stream or tributary that leads into this river of the women's suffrage movement. Uh, to that point, Barbara, the next question was, was there not a close coordination between women's struggle to gain suffrage and the prohibition movement that played a critical role in achieving success for both amendments? Yes, and if I had had probably five more minutes and if I had put one more slide around World War I, it would have been a slide about the prohibition movement, so I'm glad you asked that. So alcohol ties into this whole story in a number of different contexts. Um, first of all, it ties in at the very beginning, because in addition to the abolitionist movement, another reform movement that begins before the Civil War is the temperance movement, as some of you may know. And a number of women's rights activists, including Susan B. Anthony and Elizabeth Cady Stanton and many others, really get their start in the temperance movement, the movement to try to restrict and limit alcohol. So that's just important to know. 
It's also important to know that one of the big growth points in the women's suffrage movement after the Civil War is when a woman named Frances Willard becomes head of an organization called the Women's Christian Temperance Union. Um, and she says the ballot is important for home protection to stop men from having the ability to, that if, that if alcohol is banned, men can't drink away their wages, that the amount of desertion, poverty, abuse, and so forth will decrease. And that brings a whole bunch of women into the women's suffrage movement. So that's also important. Then, of course, there was fear by the liquor industry. And when I say liquor industry, I don't just mean the big breweries, but also every saloon, every bar, everybody who wanted to go out drinking, that if women could vote, that they would enact prohibition and that that would be a problem for anybody who wanted alcohol. So the liquor industry was probably the biggest financiers of the opposition to the women's suffrage movement. And unquestionably, uh, it is no accident that it was very soon after the Prohibition Amendment was enacted, which is in 1918, before women could vote, that the liquor industry said, we already lost, now what we're gonna do is try to get it repealed and they stopped pouring money into defeating women's suffrage. So that was another very important thing that helped pave the way for the adoption of women's suffrage. Mm. Uh, another uh, participant says, can you speak about the Women's Tea Party of 1873? Sure. Um, so the Women's Tea Party, one of the things that I assume this, will, that this person's asking about the Boston Women's Tea Party, or at least I'm gonna answer as if the person is. Um, so one of the many things that women's rights activists did was they were very good at using patriotic symbols, just like Elizabeth Cady Stanton had used the Declaration of Independence as her model for the Declaration of Sentiments. In 1873, the anniversary of the Boston Tea Party, Lucy Stone was one of the leaders, Abby Kelly Foster, a number of the other um, uh, women's rights activists in Massachusetts, they called together a tea party to protest the fact that women were taxed without representation, one of the slogans of the American Revolution. Um, they did it in Faneuil Hall, where, of course, a meeting to organize the Boston Tea Party in 1773 had been held. Um, and they essentially you know, claimed that they were calling on the legacy of the American Revolution to try to persuade men to understand that what women in 1873 were asking for was really the same thing that American men in 1773 had been asking for, which was simply a voice in government and the right not to be taxed without representation. Um, so it was, it was really a publicity stunt, but a very effective one. Barbara, uh, the women who were not married, uh, but were very active in the movement, how did they support themselves? Excellent question. Um, so it depended on the era. I mean, obviously, one of the things I talked about today was women who didn't need to support themselves because they were heiresses or widows uh, and had fortunes. Um, as time went on, particularly when you have the influx of college educated women, they worked in different jobs. They worked as social workers, they worked as teachers, they worked as, as in other occupations um, and had evening or other time to donate to the movement. As you get to the final years of the movement, when the movement has more money itself, it's able to pay wages to some organizers and people working in the movement. Um, very early on, people like Lucy Stone and others supported themselves with lecture fees. I mean, lectures were, as I said, a form of entertainment. Um, and if you were a good lecturer, you could get, people would pay small amounts of money to come to a hall and hear you speak. Um, so there were various ways in which women were able to support themselves um, and sought to support themselves throughout. Um, I don't know if there's a follow-up question to expand on that, but you know that's basically another just interesting aside. One of the things that I um, sometimes note is the way in which women, you know, had to think about how the public might view them. So Maud Wood Park, who was one, is one of my favorites, as you probably can tell, who founded the College Equal Suffrage League, who becomes the lead lobbyist in Washington later on. She becomes later, after 1920, the first president of the new League of Women Voters. Maud Wood Park married in college, she graduated in 1898. She was widowed soon thereafter, and she remarried. And she kept her remarriage a secret from all but her closest friends, 
all during the rest of the suffrage movement because she felt that she would just be so extra criticized for having a husband who she was at home taking care of or giving children to. So she felt it was just easier for people to accept that she was odd and single than that she was married and irresponsible. Question, isn't it surprising or a statement that the uh, patriarchal Mormon church supported women's suffrage in Utah? Yes. Um, the fact that Utah is one of the earliest states to support women's suffrage is a, a fascinating story. And um, for anybody who wants to read about it, I mean, I can't really do it justice in just a minute or two, but if you just Google um, women's suffrage Utah, or even if you want to get really precise, women's suffrage Utah polygamy, um, you can read about the support for women's suffrage. It was very divisive. Um, very complicated. And actually, Utah, one of the things it had to do as part of becoming a state, of course, was to renounce polygamy. But so the story of how conservative polygamists in Utah came to support women's suffrage, yes, I, I recommend that that is, is something that, that people who are interested um, read about and pursue. It's always with students, when I teach, it's always a favorite topic. I'm going to ask a final question and give, then give you a chance to make a final comment, Barbara. The question is, what role did women novelists play in the suffrage movement? Well, women novelists played you know, a huge role in so many different well, I mean, that's such a complicated question because I mean, there's everything from, you know, Charlotte Perkins Gilman writing, you know, the yellow wallpaper. So, so they were radical women writers who wanted to probe every patriarchal institution, including the home and how women were treated at home um, to show the, you know, the idiocy, the unfairness of how women were treated. Going back to the very beginning, you know, the early years of the movement, if you go back after a talk like this and reread Louisa May Alcott, um, particularly if you reread Little Men and Joe's Boys, um, you will see her clear support for women's rights and women's suffrage coming through. Um, in those books of hers. Um, Lydia Mariah Child, who was both a novelist and also wrote books about taking care of homes and so forth, you know, was a leader and an abolitionist. So there were many women writing. Oh, Ina's uh, Haynes Gilmore, who wrote a famous series that some of your audience might be personally familiar with, the Maida books, M-A-I-D-A. -A. She was the co-founder with Maud Wood Park of um, the College Equal Suffrage League and the Maida books. You know, Maida is a uh, privileged daughter of a widower father, um, but she sets up a little store and you know, runs her own life essentially. So there were a lot of novelists um, probing the boundaries of what was acceptable for women. But then of course, at the same time, there were all the novelists who were reflecting convention um, and they probably were even more popular, you know, by and large, you know, all the books about women's searches for the perfect husband and so forth. So um, novelists, just like they do today, you know, come down in all different spheres. But there certainly were a number of well-known novelists um, who were supportive of women's rights. Barbara, I want to thank you so much, uh, not only for the way you presented, but the extent of your knowledge about the subject. I think it's been very impressive. I want to thank the participants uh, for their uh, comments and good questions. Uh, and I'll give you a chance, Barbara, to say anything that you'd like to say uh, at the end of this presentation. Uh, I don't know what else I would say other than every time you have the chance to vote, vote. And every chance time you have the opportunity to defend somebody else's right to vote, I hope that you will do so. And I think I will leave it at that. That's a great ending, Barbara. Thank you very much. And thank everybody for participating. Good afternoon. Thank you so much.